Well, it's been a few weeks, so figured it's time to bring it back. The Q&A video. Hooray. And good thing about this, we had enough questions. It looks like enough good questions or those that will elicit some type of reaction out of me. Then I'm going to break this up into two parts. So this is part one of the weekly Q&A. Part two will come up several hours later. So if you didn't get your questions answered that you submitted via Twitter, make sure you follow the show on Twitter at OTR Central is the Twitter handle. Uh, make sure you check out part two as well because your question may have been answered there. I'll try to get through most all of them. Uh, but with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Ad Andreas underscore Byron asks, who do you think would have the best phone sex operator voice call? Dusty Rhodes, Kenny Olivier, Macho Man, or Paul Bear? By the way, Jim Cornette says Kenny Olivier should have a career in phone sex. <laughs> Imagine Paul Bear. Oh, yeah! <laughs> the Macho Man. Yeah! Give it to me, baby! But I don't think anybody could touch the American Dween thus. The woes, baby. Lay back and let the American dream spill his hot cream all over your face, if you will. Like, that, that's that got to be it, doesn't it? You, you would think so. Uh, at Dalek of Chaos, if Brian Pillman never had that car accident, what do you think his career in WWF would have been? Oh, man. You talk about one of those great what-ifs, like... He was one of those guys that was helping with the company's transition to a more adult theme, more edgy product. He was going to be one of those, he was one of those forefathers of what became the Attitude Era. Like, yeah, one of those burning what if questions. Because if he was around during the Attitude Era, like he would have helped make guys. He would have been a big deal himself. He would have been like that upper mid card to lower main event type of guy is what I would have envisioned for him. He would have been the guy that if you're working him as a face, he's the face that a heel works with on their way up to Austin or rock. Or if you're working him as a heel, kind of same deal. He's the guy that's the stop on the way. Like he could have been a big star in the attitude era. And it's a shame we never got to find that out. Just how big he could have been. Uh, at MC 17 Clark. Out of all these three decisions Vince McMahon has made over the years, which one was the worst and why? Buying WCW and ECW, Linda Senate campaign, or going public in 1999? Let's see. Going public in 1999 was a financial windfall. Buying WCW and ECW for a pittance of a price compared to future revenues and profits obtained from it, you know, that was a windfall as well. Uh, there's only one of these that cost him $100 million that he was never able to recoup, and that was Linda's two Senate campaigns. That's by far the worst decision, is investing $100 million of his own money into it. I'm surprised he didn't put the XFL here. I'm surprised. Yeah, from a dollars and cents bottom line standpoint, this is a Senate campaign. It's not even close. Uh, Kill Link underscore Mukahid. Did you like the triple or Tribal Chief triple threat match at this year's WrestleMania better than all the other three-way main event matches from the previous Manias, 20, 30, 31, 35? Um, the only one that might have touched it in its moment and its time would be 20 because there was a lot of emotion staked in that one and the players involved. Um, but I loved it. It might have been my favorite. Certainly fucking better than 35. Sure as hell better than 30. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, so it might be. It just might be. At Splash Bro... Easy for me to say today. At Splash Bro, Kieran. I'm sorry, Kieran. Um, excluding the invasion itself, why did so many people hate Vince WWE for ECW and WCW going out of business? It's not Vince's fault the other two ran themselves into the ground and they were fighting for their own company survival in the war. Mm. Sometimes it's easy to scapegoat Vince as being the be-all, end-all of evil in professional wrestling and he certainly has earned that moniker in a variety of different ways at different times. Uh, but the reality is, is it was more just about the fact that there were millions of people that loved WCW and there were lots of fans that loved ECW and they blame Vince for it because it was the war that he ultimately won. So he's the winner. So therefore, he's the heel. Now, justifiable hate or not, it's the reality of it. That's the business world. That's how things played out. Um, 
But, you know, I think it's that and then, like, the other stuff that led up to it. Like, yeah, fundamentally changed the wrestling business in not a good way. So I get it. Doesn't make it fair, but I get it. Um, at California EST 96 asked, you may not be the biggest fan of the guy, but I'm curious on your thoughts on how Daniel Bryan has been able to gain such a fandom over the years. What is it about that dude, the dude, that's been able to appeal to all members of the audience? Um, decent worker. Got to a place where he learned how to be a character performer in a WWE sense. Got better on the mic. Um, he has kind of like this natural connection and charisma. Like, it's understated, but there's like a genuineness there, an organic feeling about Daniel Bryan that I think does resonate with a lot of people. When you say that he was able to appeal to all members of the audience, like, you know, he wasn't a big time massive megastar by any stretch of the imagination, but he certainly had a period of time where he was a pretty hot, white hot character uh, relative to wrestling today. So I think it's a lot of that genuineness. Like he's an example of he was a guy that everybody felt was like the everyday guy and they could associate with being like him or wanting to be like him. In terms of he wasn't the larger than life guy, but he was a regular average Joe and people enjoyed seeing him be successful. Problem is you get too many guys like that that all look the same and feel the same now and nobody really stands out. But at least we could say a little bit with Daniel Bryan, like it was that along with many other things. That's a part of the reason I think that he, you know, got the following that he did. Uh, it also helped that he spent a long time wrestling around the world and, and built and amassed a following that came with him to WWE. At Mr. Underscore Jinx 5 push Barry or fire Ricochet, Dolph Ziggler, Dana Brooke. Well, the push one? Push Dana Brooke. Why not? Barry Ricochet, because at least he can get a job and have a job and keep getting paid. So I'm not being that unkind to him. And then, <laughs> fire Dolph Ziggler. How about that? Like, you knew where that was going. You knew there was, yeah, the other two compared to him. I mean, that's night and day. Give me a break. At Blue Goblin Zero One asks, who could have been some of Owen Hart's best rivals if Kansas City never happened? Who could have possibly turned him babyface? Who could have been some of Owen Hart's best rivals? You know, Kurt Angle. Would have been a fantastic dance partner. Chris Jericho would have been a fantastic dance partner. Uh, in that era, in that time, oh yeah, yeah. Like those are two right there that I could think of. Uh, at that time, he probably could have done a great program somehow, some way between him and China. Like, oh God, who else? Um, you know, as the tag teams went, tag team came into being like during the Attitude Era. You could say that he could have done business with the Dudleys and the Hardys and Edge and Christian, like him in the tag team division, like he could have been like a veteran and kind of a standard bear, like he could have kicked ass in that role too. There's a lot of things that he could have done. Like he could have done more business maybe with him and Brian Pillman, like the possibilities were endless. Sucks so much that he was taken from us so soon. At Illogical Reason 1. Uh, there really isn't a need for Hulk Hogan Dark Side of the Ring episode, is there? Uh, I think need, desire, want, maybe different questions. I think you could certainly look at Hulk Hogan and say, well, he's alive, so it's not quite the Dark Side of the Ring like some of the other ones. Uh, but you could certainly talk about in recent years, there has been some Dark Side of the Ring stuff and... You talk about his marriage and divorce from Brooke, um, Linda, excuse me, not Brooke. Although some of you'd be like, he was dating his daughter, brother. No, no, no. Uh, but you look at what happened with Linda, you talk about the tape that came out. Like, there's certainly a dark side of the ring there, a story for that part. But you're not really talking much about the dark side of the ring, like, throughout the core and, like, peak of his career. So I don't think the dynamics work the same. I really don't. Uh, I don't think there's a need for it, nor necessarily a desire for it. At Demarcus Flowers, is the Tribal Chief going to have to give Jamie, Jimmy the same therapy he gave Jay, or would you prefer a brother versus brother feud and have Jay beat some sense into Jimmy? How about both? 
I mean, if Main Event J can't get it done, then the Tribal T can lay down that Samoan justice. But um, I kind of would like the thought of doing a brother versus brother thing more than Jimmy and Roman. Like that, that can work a little bit, especially with the dynamics going on. And you have Roman kind of being a pillar and cog of the entire story. Um, but you could do Jimmy and Roman, and I think that would work as well. So I, I'd go with either way. <clears throat> uh, at Hashira95, what's your favorite wrestling documentary? My favorite... Hmm. Favorite documentary wrestling related of all time. Uh... I'll say Wrestling with Shadows and here's why. Because it was tremendous insight into that period of time in WWF. And, you know, to me it was also fascinating insight to the Raging Eagle Maniac that Bret Hart is and was and always will be. Um, and that was very interesting. Like, have the cameras there as the Montreal Screwjob was going down? Like, yeah, that's probably got to rank up there at the top at the favorite. Um... At Andreas underscore Byron gets a second question here because his question is pretty important. Can we have an update on how Summer is doing? You may certainly get just that. Summer completed her sixth and final chemo treatment on Monday, May the 3rd, at which point in time the doctors have declared her cancer-free. So we maintain vigilance and will continue to do follow-up checkups throughout the course of the rest of the year. She has a uh, another checkup and ultrasound coming up on June 1st to make sure that everything looks good with her abdomen. abdomen. Several chest x-rays have come back perfectly clean. Blood work or CBCs have been fantastic every time she would go in for chemo. Like, she is drawn her inspiration from the tribal chief and she sat there and kicked cancer's ass. Hashtag Summer Strong. So she is fantastic and thank you for asking about her. Um, at Nebuch Sid, Disco Ben, which of the AEW docs were are you most looking forward to? I was going to say the Booker T one, and then I didn't watch it last night. So, oopsie daisies. I'll have to go find that one. That might have been the one I was looking the most forward to, really. Um, at Canadian C273, if Brian Pillman lived, could he have been a main eventer in the Attitude Era? I know he was starting to cover, recover from the car crash at the time. Yeah, I certainly think he could have been. Like, he wouldn't have been, like the main eventer that you consistently counted on, but he would be one of those guys you could rotate in and out of the main event scene. Like I talked about a little earlier with the other Brian Pillman question. I think he was that upper mid card, lower main event level guy. Like he was a, a top eight to 12 type of dude. So you could do business with him. Although I think to the point, like putting him in that world title scene may have been a little too restrictive for him and some of the things that he would do. Like, he feels like he's the type of guy that you would love to build a WrestleMania show around him being what I've talked about over the years with that mid-card, just pure grudge feud, that there's no titles, it's just about bragging rights, it's about animosity, and he would have been perfectly suited for filling that type of role. Um, i got time for one more question here for this first part. Spinner Media YouTube. I was almost hoping that was a SpinnerNet question. SpinnerNet one, baby. Uh, bigger bus signing in AEW. Miro or the Good Brothers? Yes, Miro. I'll go Miro. Also, would you rather have John Moxley or Seth Rollins on your roster? Ah. Moxley. I don't want anything to do with Seth Rollins rating Slayer. I'm sorry. Just no. Good God, no. Fuck no. <laughs> so, I'm... Close to the 15 minute mark, so I'm gonna wrap up this. This is part one of the Q&A. Like I said, if you didn't have your questions answered yet, uh, check out part two that'll come up a few hours after this because they might be answered there. Thank you again to everybody that follows the show on Twitter at OTR Essentials, the Twitter handle, you should follow it. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you smash that subscribe button, click the bell, what the hell, do it! Just do it, come on! All right, I'll be back for part two of the Q&A a little later. Bye.